This series was made possible by generous donations by the Westridge Foundation, MOAD members, and all of you. Thank you so much. I want to also thank our co-presenter, Catchlight, whose Visual Storytelling Summit is returning to San Francisco on April 29th, 2023. You can find more information on Catchlight's website at www.catchlight.io. I'm thrilled to be joined by my guest today, uh, Aida Moulané. Born in Addis Ababa in 1974, Moulané graduated from Howard University in Washington, D.C. with a degree with communications, with the communications department and a major in film. Her photography has been published widely and can be found in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, Hood Museum, the RISD Museum of Art, and the Museum of Biblical Art in the United States. She was the 2007 recipient of the European Union Prize in the uh, Reconte Africaine de la Photographie in Bamako, Mali, the 2010 winner of the Craft International Award of Photography in Spilimbergo, Italy, and the 2018 Catchlight Fellow in San Francisco, USA. In 2019, she became the first Black woman to co-curate the Nobel Peace Prize exhibition, and in the following year, she returned as a commissioned artist for the prize. She has been a jury member for several photography competitions, most notably the Sony World Photography Awards and the World Press Photo Contest in 2017. She's also been on various panel discussions on photography, including the African Union Cultural Summit, Art Basel, TEDx Johannesburg, and she gave the renowned Sim Presser lecture at the World Press Photo Festival in Amsterdam in 2019. A Canon ambassador, Moulané is the founder of the Addis Photo Fest, the first international photography festival in East Africa held since 2010. As an educator and cultural entrepreneur, she continues to develop projects with local and international institutions in Ethiopia and Cote d'Ivoire. Welcome, Aida. It's so fantastic to have you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for accepting the opportunity. <laughs> um, can you please tell us where you're at right now and, and how are things going for you? So right now I'm in Abidjan and Cote d'Ivoire, which is uh, West Africa. Yeah, and what brought you to Cote d'Ivoire? Um, actually, I came to Cote d'Ivoire initially um, when I met, there was a photographer named, he passed away a few years ago, but uh, Frank Fanny, who was an Ivorian photographer. Uh, we met at the Smithsonian when we did the uh, Divine Comedies exhibition, which was the, the collection of Simone Jami um, that was curated, I believe, in 2014. And he was really the first person that mentioned Abidjan. And I was like, I have no idea where that is. And then a few years later, uh, I came here for an exhibition at the Foundation Don Wai, uh, where I showcased my work. And then the, the year after, uh, because I was the recipient of the Catchlight Fellowship, so uh, I chose to include Cote d'Ivoire in that project and ended up coming back to Cote d'Ivoire with my team for us to, uh, to do some work here as well. And after that, it's just, you know, uh, it's been really a city that I like very much and has really uh, been the, uh, the next base for me outside of Ethiopia. Oh, wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. And and what are some of the projects that you've been working on since you've been there? Um, I mean, we, we just recently launched uh, on December 8th, the Africa Photo Fair, uh, which is a, a photography festival uh, really bringing Addis Photo Fest to West Africa. And uh, one of the key things for me was I've always wanted to have inter connectedness between different countries in Africa because I found that you know we don't really interact everything is either as I mentioned to you you know everything is either focused in Europe or focused to the west so um, so for me coming to Cote d'Ivoire and bringing the projects you know uh, whether it's education festival the studio you know all these things I wanted to also have a presence in West Africa so uh, so we managed to do that. And then also I've set up a uh, photography printing facility because, again, 
in all the years of teaching, one of the big challenges is having, you know, quality photo printing. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of us are printing abroad, uh, you know, rarely get an opportunity to see our work printed in person. So uh, it was very important to set up the uh, Africa Print House because I realized that in the education process, you know, uh, the digital is, the, that's not the final frontier. You know, it's actually when you see your work in, in mm -hmm. the physical that you get to understand, you know, the technical aspects of your work. And I always say that the print is the revealer of all secrets for photographers. So when you see your work in print, it's very different from seeing it on your screen. So, uh, so these projects are things that I've been working on for the past few years and uh, really uh, trying to expand on um, educational activities as well. That, that, I mean, that's incredible. Uh, you know, I think like most people or, or, or maybe, I don't, I don't, I don't know. My, my first uh, knowledge of you was as an artist and that's what we're mostly going to spend today's conversation on today. Um, you know, your work is stunning. It's, it's the kind of work that the second, the first time that you see it, it arrests you um, in the most amazing way um, and speaks I don't, I don't know. There, there, there's a, there's a language of your work that, that just comes through that immediately pierces, you know, to the, to the soul, to the core of folks. Um, and, you know, after a while, then you start to realize that there's all of these deeper meanings behind the work. And what I think is really incredible about you is, you know, before we went live, I was like, how do you sleep? <laughs> You've got, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're an educator, um, you participate in the development of culture across the continent. Um, how do all these things come together? Uh, and again, how do you sleep at? <laughs> how do you how do you find the time to sleep or to have respite while doing all of these projects? I mean, for me, it's uh, I only engage in things that I feel passionate about and. Um, and this is really, you know, when I first moved to Ethiopia uh, back in the uh, end of 2007, I was only supposed to be there for like a few months because I was working mm -hmm. on a film project. And I realized, you know, if we're if we're trying to change the, the perception of Africa, we're trying to change the image of Africa. I mean, we can sit here and complain about it, but unless we really focus on solutions, and, and this one thing I've said in the past is that I'm, I'm not here to, to talk about problems. I'm here to find solutions. And I think we need to take action towards those solutions. So uh, as an African, as someone who grew up abroad as an immigrant and realizing sort of these sort of, I don't know, views that people have abroad as it relates to my country of Ethiopia and also my continent, I felt that, okay, I need to engage in things that move things forward. So all these activities that I do are really um, an extension of my artistic practice. I'm a big believer in artist-led initiatives, especially in Africa. It's not a journey for everybody. I don't expect everyone to do that, but this is the journey that I've chosen to do. Um, and I've had the privilege of really having amazing mentors. You know, my, my mentors were African-American photographers who had shared so much of their own personal experience with me. And all I could do was basically do the same for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So all the things that I engage in, it's not, you know, clearly we all want to make money. We all want to have success. You know, there's all these things. But at the end of the day, I, I come from a culture where it's not about how much money is in your bank account when you die. It's like, who have you transmitted or mm. transferred that, you know, that baton to, you know, that torch to, because that's really the, the legacy that you build at the end. So uh, I've often said, you know, it's easy for me to make my work. I mean, I, I function almost like a, a factory, I guess, you know, because there's a lot that I still have to say. Uh, but I've always said, you know, the, the easiest is hanging my work on white walls. The most difficult is changing the discourse of the photography mm. industry and how it perceives uh, photographers in Africa and also how Africa is visualized. And again, the conversation is also what is our visual aesthetics as Africans and to really also shift the perception of what people think is Africa, really. So uh, so within that, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. And also it's just a matter of, you know, time management. It's about what is your priorities, you know? Uh, to me, uh, it's, I rest very well at night. 
um, but also, you know, I, I try to make the best use of my time because uh, time is quite precious. Mm. And when you're pursuing a life with a specific purpose, it's about like how focused you are on what that end game or what is that end goal. And I've been quite blessed and quite privileged uh, to be able to do the things that I feel passionate about. Well, thank you for those words of wisdom um, and, and inspiration. Um, you mentioned just, just now some of your, your mentors, and I know you've had some quite famous mentors. Um, can you please talk a little bit about those folks? Who are they? I mean, the first is Chester Higgins. Uh, Chester Higgins has played, I think, I always talk about him in all my interviews because uh, I don't think he realized what he has given to me. Uh, and I always believe that, you know, the expression, we, we stand on the shoulders of those be, before us. And Chester Higgins was that person. And I remember when I was at Howard, um, you know, I had shifted from photography into cinema and I found his book uh, inside the uh, the library, and I was really mesmerized. Uh, the book, I believe, called In the Spirit, which has all these black and white images of mm -hmm. uh, people of color in in the diaspora and so forth and what have you. And to see these images, I was like, wow, this is like so fascinating that he's captured what I've always wanted to capture, which is my people with dignity and you know, through the challenges to be able to capture them uh, as people, you know. And the first time I met him was he had a show at the Smithsonian. And um, and I just went up to him. This is before internet, you know, before cell phones or what have you. And I just said, sir, can I have your phone number? You know, I just want to show <laughs> you my work. And at that time, you know, I had no money. And I, I don't know if you uh, you remember, but, you know, the 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 Chinatown bus hadn't started yet. So, you know, it's just greyhounding it to New York just oh for my like, goodness. because I, I couldn't afford to stay anywhere. So it's basically going there just to show my work for a couple hours, going to Brooklyn and then getting back on the bus and then heading back to DC. So, uh, so he was a key part in that of just staying true to it. And then the other person for me is uh, Dudley Brooks, uh, who's the photo director at Washington Post magazine. And, you know, he was also Washington Post photographer and he's the one that pulled me into the Washington Post, uh, which was, you know, very difficult institution to get into. But by him believing in that, uh, you know, this was a good opportunity for me to learn, you know, as a photojournalist, you know, that really gave me a full perspective of how the media industry works. And Dudley also came uh, to Addis Photo Fest, you know, mm -hmm. for a few times. So it, it's very uh, endearing for me to see, like, my mentors see what their input what has been achieved because of their input and for me to have reached a specific level and for them to be witnesses to that. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the, the first photographers was Harley Little Jr., who was a studio photographer doing commercial work. He was really the first one to sort of take me under his wing to make me understand the business of photography. So uh, so in that sense, you know, I've, I've been, like I said, I've been very lucky. I've, I've, I've met people who have believed in me and have guided me along the way. And this is why I think as artists, it's so important to have mentors, uh, but not only to have mentors, but once you've made it to also give respect back to the mentors and to sort of remember like, you know, what each person has inputted as it relates to, you know, your progression within the field, because the art world is not, it's not an easy place to exist in. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I think you're definitely making it an easier place for folks and then opening these doors, which, you know, I love the fact that, you know, it's, it's you you seem to operate off of the, the philosophy of each one, teach one, but then also lifting as, as we go along um, to, to support those. Um, and I encourage folks, if you haven't checked out, you can look at Aida's website and you can see all of her projects and learn more about them um, because just the, um, the amazing amount of work that you're doing is incredible, especially on the continent um, and bridging, like you said, bridging, East Africa and West Africa, which I think is this very unique um, position that that you're in, and I think one that I would love to see much more of on the continent, um, instead of you know reaching out to the West constantly for support. Um, 
today put into the comments and I just want to remind uh, Chester Higgins Jr. did create the photograph which is the face of Moad um, so if you were to stare at the facade of Moad there's a three foot uh, story tall photograph um, and that's a Chester Higgins Jr. project um, as long as as well as several of the photos within the photo mosaic um, so thanks for that reminder today um, yeah Chester Higgins Jr. has a connection to photography worldwide. Um, and I love that you have that personal connection with him as well. I wanna get into your art practice now um, and, and think about the history that you have as an artist. Um, I come from a, an education standpoint. So I'm always you know, wondering, and I'm always getting the question from folks, well, how, do you, how does one become an artist? How do you know that you're an artist? So if you don't mind going back into your history a little bit, uh, and letting us know, and yes, I will turn on closed captions for the person who just requested it. It should be available. Um, thanks for that question. But yeah, can you ask, you know, can, can you let us know what is the first piece of art that you made and what sparked that interest um, in creating an artist? How did you know that that was a path for you? Wow, I mean, there's so many phases, I think. Um that I've gone through. And I think my initial um, sort of provocation was, you know, living in Canada um, during the, the famine of the 80s and what people perceived what, you know, what was really going down, uh, which, you know, as you know, there, there are a multitude of stories within one country. It's not just a one-sided story, but um, I think, I started out as an athlete and I was playing uh, sports. And then uh, in Canada, you know, there was this, I went to Western Canada High School in Calgary, which had a really an amazing art uh, classroom with a teacher who basically was passionate about teaching, you know, uh, what we were interested in. And at that time, there was only five of us who had asked him, you know, what is that room over there? And it was mm -hmm. a dark room. So we're like, well, what the hell is the dark room? And then, you know, it's where you develop film. And we're like, okay, well, can you show us? And I think the magic started when I saw my first print. I mean, I still remember it. It was a black and white photo of a blossoming flower. I mean, uh, you know, in photography terms, it's a very cliche romantic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that whole process, I was like, wow, you know, I can take a photo and develop this. And then it comes alive in this liquid. I'm like, this is so fascinating. So my first exhibition was actually at the age of 19 in Vancouver at the uh, Vancouver Library. Um, and what I was trying to express was sort of this lack of representation within Canada as it relates to people of color, you know, uh, especially Africans and Caribbeans and the diaspora. And from that, um, you know, I come from a family that you know, my, my mother always believed that, you know, she always used to say, you know, whatever you choose to do in life, you better be the best at it. So her whole thing was like, if you want to be a garbage woman, you better be the best garbage woman on that block, you know. So, um, and my mom also has always had this affinity for art and music and, and what have you. But through that journey, um, I entered Howard and I was actually, my plan was to become a lawyer. This was my whole thing. I wanted to do international law. <laughs> and uh, at that time, uh, Haile Garima and also uh, Gashabi Ford, they were, you know, the two Ethiopian professors in communication. So they're the ones that brought me back into creativity because they saw my photo work and they're like, You're, you don't belong in the School of Business, you need to be in communication. And so through all of those journeys and so forth, um, it's not a matter of like having this, you know, epiphany moment, this is what I'm going to become. It's just a matter of being curious. And I've always been a very curious person um, to really pursue what I felt passionate about. And always creativity has been within me. Photography has been something that has taught me so much about life. And so I just decided to pursue it. And the work that you see now that actually really was encouraged by Simone Jami when he did uh, the exhibition, The Divine Comedies, which really uh, was sort of uh, the first sort of challenge to me from Simone to, to, you know, get me to move out of photojournalism and to create work that, you know, wasn't black and white photography because most people just had known me for black and white photography. So it was really him that 
sort of, you know, opened that that space for me to be able to sort of pursue this this route and what people see now. But most people don't realize, like, I have all these other backgrounds, you know, uh, that I come from photojournalism base, that I'm actually a filmmaker, you know, there's all these other complexities. Mm. But when I look at how I got to where I arrived today, Simone was one of those key people uh, that helped me transition into the art world. That's inc that's incredible. You have, I mean, you have some networks with with really amazing people. I mean, Simone and Jami, one of the premier curators and scholars, um, particularly of art from Africa um, and and Africa's diaspora. Just in case folks don't know, he's yeah, he's <laughs> way up there. <laughs> Just, just like you, Aida. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, before I go into you know showing examples of your work, um, which is the, the really exciting part, I can't wait. Um, they're so vivid. Um, can you please talk a, a little bit about you know the role that your family and family's history. I know you've moved around a lot um, <laughs> growing up as well, and so you know how did all those experiences of you coming into age, you touched upon that a little bit, but how, how do those influence your work? Um, and even the way that you compose and think about the production of your work? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think a lot of people, uh, it's funny to me to, to get like interview questions where people ask me, you know, were your parents diplomats, you know, uh, <laughs> were they this and that? And I'm like, no, it's just my mother trying to find a better place to live. You know, I, I don't come from, uh, you know, very romantic background. Uh, you know, I come from very humble beginnings. And I believe that having lived in these different parts of the world was not, uh, you know, it's just out of options of to always try to find the better place. And, you mm -hmm. know, finally, when we immigrated to Canada, this was like the, the place for, uh, for me to be able to get an education. And, um, but, Within that, it's really, um, I think, when you travel a lot, and this is the one thing I realized that a lot of Americans don't do, is mm. Americans don't travel a lot. And um, and I always find that surprising because there's a whole world out there that really forms your character, forms who you are. Even most recently, like I was in Ghana in uh, end of December, and I saw how 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 many African Americans were traveling to Accra, and I was like, mm -hmm. "Wow, this is so fascinating," because uh, it just adds another perspective on what you see in the media and then what is actually on on the ground, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so in that sense, like having lived in so many different cultures, um, you really are able to also understand how that influences sort of what inspires me as well. And that's the thing, like beauty is not limited to one space or one time or one form, you know, beauty is everywhere, but you have to really go out there and look for it. And uh, in that sense, I think uh, the work that I, that I make is just a reflection of that. And it, it really showcases, I think, my, my thinking process and sort of my own personal experiences because these works are also a visual diary of just my, you know, the, the things that I have seen and also the the thoughts and ideas that I that I want to share. That's beautiful. Um, and without further ado, I want to dive into some of these images because, oh my gosh, um, I'm, I'm sure everyone who has joined us is familiar with your work, but just in case someone is not, for some strange reason, <laughs> um, we're just going to go into these and Please let me know. Are you seeing my the screen with the notes or are you seeing the full screen? I'm um, seeing, I guess, the image with the, the title of the work. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, sometimes this thing has thoughts of its own. <laughs> um, so, uh, Dale, I have closed captioning on this screen as well. So <laughs> hopefully you can see that. Um, this project that that you did, um, this was all about water. Um, so, yeah, I would love to know more about this work beyond just the beauty of it and the intensity of the color. Um, please tell us about this project. 
this was actually my first uh, large body of work commissioned from an organization called Water Aid, which works on uh, different issues relating to water security, health, education, you know, all, all the, the gamuts relating to uh, water. Um, when they initially approached me, um, what I told them was that like, uh, you know, when we think about Africa and water security, it's always the same thing. It's like, you know, the kid at the water well or, you know, the, the yellow buckets or, you know, the desert. So I told them, like, if they wanted to hire me as a photojournalist, this wasn't really something as exciting to me. But um, I told them I had some ideas to do it within my process. And they agreed to it. And this was actually a project that was supported by the H&M Foundation. So it was a very interesting experience um, because it was also a way for me uh, to go back into this location. Um, what you see in the image is actually uh, all real with the obviously the Photoshop uh, retouching. Um, but this is in the uh, northeastern side of Ethiopia. Uh, this mm -hmm. is one of the lowest points in the world, which means it's super hot. And I wanted to go to this location because I felt that the landscape uh, lended itself well when we're talking about water. And also, you know, while we're shooting this, you know, the temperature is like over 100 or, you know, 45. It's, it's very hot and quite intense experience. But I found that that intense experience also lended itself into the creation of the pieces because we, we had to be even more precise and we had to be very diligent on, on how we capture the image. So what I wanted to express uh, through the collection was to reimagine the abstraction of water security, uh, mm. to utilize creativity, to advocate for something very specific. And really this was a project that was only supposed to last a year, but we're still showing it even like this month, we're still showing it uh, in different places. And even uh, at the Tate, uh, the show will go up in a few months as well. And this was a way for me to advocate for something very specific in places that um, people normally don't get messages relating to advocacy and you know the art of advocacy, as I say. So for that, it was quite uh, it was a challenging collection to build because of the heat, but mm. what we ended up coming back with was something really, uh, as I keep saying, it's it's magical and it's a way for people to think about. You know, to grab their attention when we're talking about the impact of water, because uh, I think when you live in a privileged world, you take for granted having mm -hmm. access to water. I, I always say, you know, in Africa, I would rather live without electricity than live without water any day, you know, and uh, and so these are the sort of the, the social conversations that I try to have through my work. That is amazing. Um was 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 there actually a breeze blowing you know i i, I see the way that the the fabric is, is folding over so in addition to the heat i'm imagining that it was oh, a no, little brutal that uh, desert wind it's quite intense and this was actually this image that you see from a starshine moon glow it was the final the final setup um that we did and we were like exhausted there's no escaping the sun, you know? So uh, so I was just like, we need to be done with this quickly before somebody passes out. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, but the, 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 that's an actual fabric that's blowing in the wind that we have duplicated in Photoshop and carried mm. over. Even the black and white cloth that you see on the ground, that's an actual cloth, but we just went in with Photoshop and cleaned it up so that there's more, you know, a, a direction towards it. The only thing wow. not real here is the uh, the moon. Oh wow, wow. Yeah, it's 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 just a, an absolutely arresting image. Um and here's another photograph from that same series. So I'm imagining is this in the same location, slightly different? Yeah, so this is uh same area. So so within the Alpha region, what we call the Dallow Depressions, uh you have three types of landscape. You have it's mostly salt. So what you have to imagine is that before mankind or what have, this was actually the bottom of an ocean so mm. as the ocean receded what you're left with is that ground which is very it's below sea level uh, and it's it's quite hot so within these three landscapes you have three types of what i call color palettes so uh, so the one that you saw with her in the water that's actually a salt lake uh, so everything is salt you know 
and in our country, uh, people still are digging salt in the, in the traditional way from this region. So that's what this region is known for, is that people are carving out salt, carrying it by camel, and then going into the cities to, uh, to sell it. Wow, that is incredible. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, and, and, the, and these two images are ones, I know that there's others in the series where the model is you know, carrying water jugs um, with them. Um, and yeah, we, we can also see those on your website as well. Um, but this, this one with the, I, I'm really intrigued by not only the composition, now we've got the, the two models within this image, but the kind of the branches coming out of the head um, yeah, I mean, and, the, the, and the title. Yeah, no, it's because they are. Uh, so in our tradition, like when you live in the ruler region, because hospitals and clinics are not obviously nearby, uh, anyone who is sick is actually carried on this bed that you see here. This is an actual traditional bed mm. uh, made out of wood and then uh, goat skin that, that's wrapped to make uh, sort of the bottom uh, part. And often, uh, you know, you'll see people being carried on these beds to go to uh, a doctor uh, nearby. And I just wanted to incorporate that uh, whenever I'm using uh, black and white flooring, you know, this is sort of my homage to my like CD Bay, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, oh my goodness, studio thing. And this is really talking about, you know, the, I don't know, I, I don't want to say like the burden, but just the challenges that a household uh, faces when someone in the family is sick, because it's, it's a full disruption. And when you look at, uh, in Africa, anything relating to water, uh, having access to safe drinking water, these are such simple solutions, you know, uh, but the devastation that it causes from not having access to clean water, you know, it, it has such a trickling effect in the whole society. So when I say, you know, the sores we bear, it's, you know, if, if you have a family member that's sick, that really has a big impact on the forward trajectory of that family mm -hmm. or that household, because it takes so much energy and so much effort to get that person well. Wow. Wow. That makes it even more powerful. Um, the, the colors that you use in your work, um, there, there, there's these repeating motifs of the red, white, and the blue. You know, I, I know definitely of the earlier pieces that I'm aware of with the, with the intensity on the red and the white. Um, can you please talk about both the role of body paint um, in your work, but then also the colors and the significance of, of the various colors that you use. I mean, the, the colors uh, initially started out as, um, you know, in uh, photojournalism, I used to always say like, I can't see color. Like it's difficult for me to get this amazing photo of color, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is why like, I've always been comfortable with black and white because for me, black and white was, um, it's just easier for me to process for some reason. So when I was going into this work, I said, okay, I, I, I still feel this way. You know, I feel like I'm at the infancy of my artistic uh, journey. I feel oh that, goodness. no, I'm telling you because it's, it's, uh, it's an unraveling process. This is how I see it. So I decided, okay, let me just focus on primary colors because it's just easier for me to process. Um, and granted like way earlier when I was trying to figure out what kind of photographer I wanted to become, I tried to do a uh, fashion photography, which I realized I sucked at because I had no concept of color, you know, <laughs> or no set design or anything like that. But uh, so I started with just the primary colors. And then I realized like these were colors that I felt very strongly about. And these were the colors that I felt very passionate about. And it wasn't until like, I think a few years into it that I realized, wow, like I'm subconsciously I've been inspired by the Ethiopian Orthodox church paintings because you know we have this long history of church paintings that um, that utilize the primary color and I realized wow like part of my heritage and my culture has seeped into my subconscious and then it's coming out into the conscious into these forms and a lot of my work has you know uh, spiritual connotations to it there's a lot of elements of universality within it but at the same time as well, uh, I've said in the past that, you know, the color 
is my seduction to you to like to bring you into the piece you know I'm seducing you in but actually behind the color there's a lot of different things inside of it and there's a lot of uh there's darkness just as there's light and I think that's where people get confused because they see these painted faces and you know again I always say like painting phases is the easiest part it's the context of what we're putting it in uh that adds these different layers and you know I've also over the years you know from different exhibitions and museum shows and so forth because the background is painted because the model is painted and you know every all the objects are placed sometimes people really think that it's a painting and I have to mm -hmm. say no it's actually a photo of a painting you know because they think that you know I have the, the skills to be able to paint and draw this amazingly I wish but, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm but sure you do I don't know. I, uh, I've tried, but you haven't seen my chicken scratches yet. That's <laughs> um, yeah, but the 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 designs within the painting, like, is are you doing all of the painting of the models? I know that you work with, uh, you know, a team for um, the set design, and sometimes these set designs are enormous. Um, you know, we're not we're not seeing the the grandeur of it necessarily within the photograph um, because of yeah. the cropping. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I, I work with a team. I've been very fortunate to have like a solid team that I work with uh, for quite some time together. You know, we're uh, at this stage, I, I want to say we're a very well old machine. Um, so initially, you know, I, I've been painting the faces sometimes like other people were painted for me. It's, you know, the way that we navigate the production of uh, a collection, it's really uh, a team effort, you know, um, and and you have to remember everything that I do starts with a sketch. So everything is sketched out, uh, mm. all the props, the color blocking, the clothing, the background sketch, all of that is mapped out. Uh, and then that way, when we actually build the set, I don't want any technical distra distractions because I'm looking for that magical moment within the mm. piece. And sometimes, you know, we'll go through all this effort, you know, I'm like, okay, this is a great idea. The set goes up, everything goes up. And then I look at it and I'm like, wow, this is such a horrible piece. But at least we're not panicking because you know we have a foundation that we can navigate through. So in that way, um, you know, having a very uh, specific process is quite important because I want to free myself in order to be able to uh, receive the image. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, so that I'm not distracted by trying to figure out what do I do next and so you know everything is very precise and often you'll see the sketch and then the final image it's usually uh you know what we've exactly created and then there are times where uh the sketch is there the image has been shot based on the sketch and then when we go into post-production then I'll end up changing something and then it becomes a completely different image than what was originally envisioned but the whole ultimate goal is to look for that specific magic in every frame uh, and to look for that magic in, in every piece. And I have to feel it uh, within my gut. And this is always a thing. And just to be clear, like I, I don't make work to please people or I don't make work uh, seeking any sort of validation. I just make work that uh, I feel very passionate about and the things that I want to say. If people like it, great. I'm very lucky for that. If people don't like it, they don't like it. But the uh, the standing point for me is really uh, these are the things, you know, I remember a long time ago, Hila Grima said, you know, the the point of being an artist is that you have to be vulnerable. In order to be vulnerable, you have to be able to vomit everything that's inside of you and put it out there, you know, and through that vulnerability, it means that there's a level of uh, sincerity. And I think, you know, I think an audience is able to read those things within it because, you know, my functionality within this space and as an artist is really to present my own truth and that's it. Oh my gosh, what golden nuggets that you're providing us with here. Um, the I, I love all of that. Um, words of wisdom for anyone who's, you know, pursuing an artistic pursuit as you know especially the the colors though I want to get back a little bit to that I I, I, I they, they they feel like there's some political connotation to me and maybe that's you know thinking of 
especially in the Western world, not just in the United States, the significance of these colors, red, white, and blue, you know, even in the French flag and, you know, so many flags around the world. Um, and, you know, then also the, 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 the models being painted white, um, which, you know, I know in some context, you know, that, that, that could also, especially when I'm thinking of many traditional, um, traditions around the continent of Africa where white is actually the color of death or of, of sight for um, those who are able to see beyond this, this world. Um, and then the gaze of the model, oftentimes they're, they're, they're staring us directly. And although, you know, at MOAD, lots of artists that come through the museum are, are really attached to, to this idea of the of models or figures looking back at us and you know sometimes it's it's you know described as them reclaiming their agency or returning the gaze so they're not objectified does any of that play a role a, as you're you know conceiving of your pieces i mean um this is my take. Uh, when you look at Picasso's work, I mean, Picasso lifted so much from Africa. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole movement was based on Africa, on these primitive things, you know, and um, and the repurposing of it into the, the the contemporary. And I've always been fascinated about traditional cultures. Part of my family comes from the village. Uh, you know, we're very still deeply rooted in the land. And the one thing for me has been um, in my research, and this is the thing, you know, for any, I guess, artist or photographers, anybody trying to enter into the into this realm of creative expression, you know, it requires a lot of research and really looking at uh, what's out there. And you also have to look at what's within you. And for that, in my research, I found that uh, initially the body painting came from the Omo Valley, which is in the southern region of Ethiopia. And I've always found it interesting because my grandmother, for example, had uh, neck tattoos. You know, it, in our region, the the beauty of a woman is based on the length mm. uh, of her neck. And in order to accentuate the, the length of the neck, you have tattoos. And these are the symbols of femininity, you know. And so to me, I've always found this uh, very fascinating of how we have uh, scarification, we have body painting, we have, de you know, decoration with jewel, you know, there's all these levels, which is basically walking art, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and these systems in traditional cultures are very highly sophisticated sy systems that I think sometimes the contemporary world kind of uh negated or to, to say you know it's primitive but to me it's no it's it's a highly sophisticated system mm -hmm. of self-expression so you know now when we look at it in, in today i mean you look at wakanda i mean wakanda took so much from ethiopia you know yeah. a, a lot of things were from ethiopia uh and also other parts of africa and i thought that was you know wow that's really you know i mean it's it's a great thing but also to to show the history and the source of where it came. I think this is the great thing that they've done. And as it relates to the body painting is I remember my first time doing Joburg Art Fair, uh, I had South Africans come up to me and they said, you know, uh, in our tradition, it's the high priests that paint themselves white because mm -hmm. it's sort of a way to like connect to the divine. And I was like, wow, that's so fascinating. And then sometimes on social media, I'll get ridiculous people who say, you know, it's a black, it's the white face of black face. And I'm oh like, it has, it has nothing to do with any of this, you know? Uh, it's about masks that we all wear. And this is why, mm. like I say, I don't paint fully the eyelids. You know, I keep the eyes there because truth is always behind layers, you know? So so this became sort of my, my signature approach. So whenever you see like the neck, uh, the neck paintings, th this is really Ethiopia for me and who I am as a woman, you know, these traditions that that we have. And even when we look at, um, you know, uh, like the research of looking at globally, when you look at, uh, you know, all these body decorations, in some strange way, at some point, patterns are connected uh, with Africa, with regions that don't have any historical connection. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so when you look at self-expression and you look at these traditional cultures, creativity is actually a form of uh, 
you know, uh, not just giving respect, but it's a it's a form of inspiration that comes from the divine. So even yeah. when you look at artifacts and when you look at any objects, uh, I, I can only speak for Africa, is that we create and we, we have creativity for the purpose of giving praise to whatever our divine order is uh, within it. So there's a spiritual connection with all these objects. And that means that, and I, I've said this before, is that I do believe that creativity is a spiritual manifestation. It is a one element that you cannot scientifically calculate creativity. You cannot scientifically really calculate like imagination or the inception of new idea. You know, these things require your environment and for you to be open uh, within that. So for for that for the body pain, it's that, and then for the um, the colors that I've chosen. Um, honestly, when I chose these colors, the French flag did not come into my mind. The American flag definitely did not come into my mind. These were just colors that I recognize just from my own past. Uh, and I, even I remember, um, uh, I think like a few months ago, somebody thought I was doing work for Ukraine. I'm like, what are they talking about? Oh, wow. Like, again, nothing to do with any of that. You know, these are just the colors that I feel passionate <laughs> about, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I love, I, I love to hear that. You know, I'm, I was, as I see them, I'm trying to read into them. Um, but I, I love also just thinking of them for their aesthetic value. Um, and and we didn't talk about that last piece, you know, also being entitled with Vietnam and then this one right here in which we remain from Namibia. Yeah, so the, the, the previous image in this one was a, a body of work that I was commissioned for the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize, um, which was given out to the World Food Program. The project was looking at how uh, food is a tool of war uh, through starvation, hunger. Um, for example, in the case of Vietnam, I believe, you know, for the uh, mustard gas bombings that happened by mm. the Americans, you know, uh, basically making a land, you know, non-functional anymore. Um, so to me, it was really, you know, how do I connect it within my own story? So a lot of the locations that I chose were countries that I had really connections to uh, or curiosities to. So, for example, in this body of work, I had Yemen because part of my childhood was in Yemen and what has happened in Yemen, it's, you know, quite devastating. I'm, I'm, you know, everything is gone, really. Uh, you know, I included Syria, I included South Sudan, Ethiopia, obviously, uh, in Namibia, and most people don't know if, as it relates to Namibia, it was really the, the first practice of, um, you know, what the Germans were using on the Jewish mm. community as it relates to um, concentration camps in, in a way, you know. Um, but the stories that I was reading as it relates to Namibia, those that were fighting against the uh, the Germans had two options, either go in this direction and get shot down or go into the desert and basically die from starvation because you're wow. been left into the middle of the desert. And and the things that I imagine is that imagine you have a whole community that, you know, is escaping death on this side, but what's waiting for them is a slow death on that side. So in my imagination, and especially as, as a mother of two children, I was thinking, wow, like, you know, imagine watching your loved ones die, you know, I mean, it's, there's a, there's a, an emotional element to it. And I guess that's, my ultimate goal with my work is to really go back and to reconnect into the, the human aspects of who we are, regardless of our borders and regardless of our location or a class and what have you. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. We have a question from Efwa um, who wants to know um, if you could please describe what the dots represent. The dots on the face, you mean? It's on the face, but in, in this case, there's the, the tree also has dots. Okay, I mean, the first, as it relates on the face, uh, this is something that I started. Uh, in fact, when I was at Howard, my first image related to body painting was uh, for the Howard, Howard Homecoming fashion show, oh, where, wow. they were, where they were looking for a, uh, you know, the image to promote the fashion show. So I, I said, well, 
you know, I'm an African in the middle of, you know, this African-American school. How do I represent my African heritage and, you know, the complexity? So I thought of like, okay, the face paint. So I painted, there's an image called the Spirit of Sisterhood. It's, it's uh, in the permanent collection at the National Museum of African Art uh, at the Smithsonian. So I started out by saying, okay, these dots, and the dots really come from my country. You know, uh, if you go to Omo Valley, O-M-O Valley, you'll see the different uh, paintings. So it started out as that. And then uh, I just made it like my signature because mm -hmm. it was part of me. It was a contemporary side of me. And then, you know, the lines are more of the traditional element uh, within that. And this is how I've been sort of navigating that. I mean, now everybody's doing dots on the face and so forth, but for me, uh, the symbols for me are quite different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I I hear that completely. Um, and I feel like we're as usual. I'm always running out of time with this, so I want to go through some of these images again. We're we're coming towards the more contemporary time or closer to now. Um, every image of yours is just absolutely stunning. Um, I'm really curious to know about this set and also the location of this incredible image. So this was a, a body of work that I did for an organization called the End Fund uh, around the topic of uh, neglected tropical disease in Africa. And also it's, you know, it's a global phenomenon as it relates to developing nations. Um, the, the commission for this, what I had requested was that it wasn't just only me making a body of work that I wanted to commission six other photographers from different parts of Africa. Wow. so that we have this full spectrum of what is disease in Africa and how do we express disease, uh, you know, again, outside of the cliche stuff and, and so forth. So in this collective that I formed, uh, you know, there was fine art photographers and also photojournalists. And in this way, I think it might be also one of the first times that you see through photography that you have all these different interpretations of one specific uh, topic and mm. through that also using creativity. Uh, this image was taken in uh, in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, in a place called Banco Forest, which is actually, uh, in the world, there's only two uh, large forests in the middle of the city. One is here in Abidjan, and then the other one is in Brazil. And I found this super fascinating uh, that for the government of Cote d'Ivoire to believe in preserving this space, mm. uh, which is a, it's a huge jungle, like right in the middle of the city. But when you go there, it's it's so beautiful and very serene. But what I wanted to do here was, uh, you know, th there was a, an artist by the name of James Kokobi who did a, uh, a an exhibition around green art. Uh, and this was actually one of the installations that remained from one of the artists. Oh my goodness. And I just thought it was so fitting. So everything that you see on here is real, by the way. This is actually inside the forest. Um, and what I wanted to express here was that when we talk about uh, in traditional communities in Africa, one of the major challenges is the negotiation between traditional medicine and Western mm. medicine. And through the research, what I've understood is that the medical practitioners have to come to terms in Africa to understand that uh, for Africans, traditional medicine is actually for your spirit and uh, uh, Western medicine is actually for the physical so these are the key challenges that we face of trying to help people to recover from you know, very basic diseases that take a toll on the community. But the one thing I, I read in the research is that after people have recovered, there is a belief that they've been cursed or, you know, or when they're sick, they're moved out of their community and they have to go live somewhere else. Oh, so I just wow. imagined, imagine being moved and you know, having to live somewhere where there's no one around and your sense of place is not there. You're away from your community and your surroundings and you've been sort of sort of you know pushed out because there's a belief that you come with some kind of you know uh, some kind of disease that might have come to you through a curse or, or what have you so these are the, the thinking process that i went through in order to make this about the loneliness and the emotional impact that most people i think in the west when we talk about disease in africa people don't take into consideration the uh you know the, the toll it has on your on your mental state you know, uh, and the depression that you go into, the loneliness, you know, the fear, you know, all these things, these are the things that I always find are missing when we mm. utilize images to advocate for specific challenges that we have in the continent. Oh my gosh, such a beautiful, incredible image. I'm gonna show one more um, before. 
I get into my final question and then also look towards the audience. Um, and this one is from 2022. Yeah. Speaking so silence, this, a very different color palette. Right. So this is actually, uh, this is a project that's going to be launched through uh, Public Art uh, out of New York on March 1st. Um, this is a project called This Is Where I Am, where I've created 12 pieces of work that will be displayed uh, in 300 uh, bus shelters in across uh, New York, Chicago, Boston, and also Abidjan. And again, this is part of uh, my belief that uh, art should not be contained within elitist spaces or mm. institutions that I believe that art needs to go to the public. So whenever I have a, an opportunity to uh, engage the, the everyday person on the streets and be able to display my work, throughout outdoor installations. I'm a big fan of that. Uh, even when you look at my collection that I did for the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto uh, for the Contact Festival, you know, this was sort of the beginnings of getting to this notion of like, I really want to take my art uh, into the streets, you know, that it's not just into these secluded settings. Mm. So, uh, so this is a project that is launching in a couple of days and will be up until May 21st. And people living in these cities, they, they will see my work sort of in all these different settings. And, uh, you know, it's a different way to, to create dialogue. That is, inc that's incredible. Um, and where, where can folks find out about? Uh, so they can, can go they to yeah, they can go to uh, publicart.org, I believe. My apologies. Um, but the there's a whole thing online. They can also find it on uh, the Bloomberg app as well. Uh, so if they if they can just go to publicartfund.org, uh, they'll find it on there. Beautiful, there, beautiful. There's other artists as well uh, that are profiled there. Awesome. Thank you so much for putting that into the chat for everyone to check out. Um, and, you know, with the last couple of minutes that we have, are there, you know, besides this project that's opening up in just a day or two, um, what's next for you? Do you have any shows, any fairs, residencies, or anything else that you would like to, um, to, to let folks know about? Yeah, I mean, you know, all the information is up on all the uh, social media accounts. Uh, I would encourage people to check out africaphotofair.com. Uh, it's Africa and then the photo is fotofair.com. Um, this is really a new approach to engaging a global audience to photography from the continent outside of just a festival setting. So I've been doing uh, interviews and podcasts of different people from across the continent, uh, I guess, to give the, the international community uh, a better understanding of our process. Because as you know, unless we're having these conversations, mm -hmm. often in articles, it's quite limited how much information the general public has access to. So, um, so through, through this website, we're also offering a print sales to support uh, photographers from the continent. You know, it's a whole ecosystem that we're engaging in. And it's it's a different way to exist uh, within, you know, our industry and also as Africans, what what we're pushing out into the world, um, because you know we're we're in a global ex existence, mm -hmm. and the definition of uh, you know the African it's more than one thing, and I believe that there's a lot of fascinating things coming out of the continent that are being pushed into the international community. But my whole goal is really to build a community around the things that I believe in, you know, around, uh, you know, creativity and image making. And uh, so that's all I'm I'm pushing forward. Um, and then the usual, you know, there's different shows coming up um, in different parts of the world. You know, all this stuff is on the social media accounts. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we, and I know you're uh, pre pretty much, uh, staying in West Africa for now. Can we expect to see you in the U.S. anytime soon? Well, I mean, I have, uh, you know, my father's side is in the U.S., so that's the only condition, and maybe I might come <laughs> for uh, the public art uh, to have a conversation, but it's just, you know, flying these days, it's, you know, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a long time, and it's a little scary proposition still, 
No, I mean, I, I prefer to travel inside Africa. You know, this is, if I'm invited anywhere in Africa, I will go regardless. Uh, of the- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Aida, thank you so, so much for joining us today for this conversation. You have always been such an incredible inspiration and I really appreciate you taking the time with us today. I know it's it's uh, getting late and it's probably nighttime where you're at right now. So I appreciate you also for the time um, difference for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity.